with his inventions for things like a breathing apparatus, a redesigned sewing machine, an enhanced traffic signal, and a hair straightening product, Garrett Morgan paved the way for African Americans to become inventors. The first three-way traffic light system was created by Garrett Morgan and later sold to General Electric. In Cleveland, Ohio, Garrett Morgan was the first black man to possess an automobile. This is the story of Garrett Morgan. So sit back, relax, let's get into it. Garrett Morgan was the seventh of 11 children. Arriving on the scene on March 4th, 1877 in Paris, Kentucky. His mother, Elizabeth Reed, was of African and Indian ancestry and a Baptist minister's daughter. His father, Sidney, was a former slave who gained freedom in 1863. Sidney was a descendant of Confederate Colonel John Hunt Morgan. As an adult, Garrett's mixed race origins would influence his economic transactions. He worked as a handyman for a Cincinnati landowner for most of his teenage years. Garrett, who was growing up during the turn of the century, had to drop out of school at an early age in order to work a full-time job. While working in Cincinnati, Garrett was able to pay a tutor and finish his education. He relocated to Cleveland in 1895 and started fixing sewing machines for a textile business. Garrett's curiosity in how things function, fueled by this encounter, he developed a reputation for mending things. Garrett began his own repair shop in 1907 after becoming knowledgeable about the inner workings of the devices and how to maintain them. He later received a patent for an improved sewing machine. Because of the success of his business, Garrett was able to settle down in Cleveland and wed Mary Ann Hosick in 1908. During their marriage, he and his wife would have three sons. Garrett's revolutionary sewing machine would quickly open the door to his financial independence. As he rode the wave of his economic success, he extended the business in 1909 to add a tailor shop with 32 employees. The new business produced coats, jackets, and dresses using sewing machines that Garrett created himself. Garrett came upon woolen fabric that had been burnt by a sewing machine needle while working with the machines in his recently opened tailor shop, which he had founded with his wife Mary, who was a seamstress. Considering how quickly sewing machine needles spun at the time, it was a regular issue. Garrett experimented with a chemical solution in an effort to lessen the friction caused by the needle, in an effort to solve the issue. And as a result, he discovered that the cloth fibers were straighter. Garrett first tested the mixture on a neighbor's dog with favorable results before using it on himself. As soon as that was successful, he promptly founded the G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Company where he offered hair care items like his preparatory hair straightening cream, a hair coloring, a hair straightening comb that Garrett had developed himself. Garrett Morgan's financial security was provided by the company's enormous success, which also gave him the freedom to explore other interests. Garrett received a patent for a breathing apparatus known as a safety hood in 1914. Its users could breathe more safely when around smoke, fumes, and other pollutants. For the safety hood and smoke protector, Garrett's early gas mask innovations, he received two patents. Customers reacted somewhat negatively to Morgan's innovations, especially in the South, where racial animosity persisted despite improvements for African American rights. Entrepreneurs at the time marketed their technologies by giving live demonstrations. In these public appearances, Garrett pretended to be his own assistant while posing with municipal fire crews and city officials. During demonstrations of his breathing apparatus, Garrett hired a white actor to portray the inventor. Garrett would then pretend as the inventor's sidekick while dressing as a Native American man dubbed Big Chief Mason while occupying spaces where breathing would otherwise be dangerous. 
His newspaper ads showed well-groomed white guys as the models. The strategy worked since a lot of people bought the device, mainly firefighters and rescue workers. The mask was rapidly adapted in New York City, and eventually 500 cities did likewise. The gas mask used in World War I to shield soldiers from the deadly gas used in combat were modeled after Garrett's breathing apparatus. A more advanced version of Morgan's gas mask won two gold medals in 1916, one from the International Association of Fire Chiefs and one at the International Exposition of Sanitation and Safety. Garrett gained national attention on July 25, 1916, when he used his gas mask to free men who had been caught in an explosion in a tunnel 250 feet below Lake Erie. For a fresh water supply, the city of Cleveland began digging a new tunnel under Lake Erie. When workmen struck a pocket of natural gas, there was a massive explosion that imprisoned them beneath stifling dust and fumes. Eleven of the workmen perished, and ten rescuers had lost their lives trying to get to them. After receiving a call in the middle of the night, Garrett Morgan and a group of volunteers, including his brother, saved the lives of two workers and found the bodies of 17 others just six hours after the explosion. Despite his valiant attempts, sales were negatively impacted by Garrett's visibility since more people shunned his devices because they knew he was a black man. To make matters worse, neither Garrett nor his brother received adequate recognition for their valiant actions at Lake Erie. Despite being nominated for the Carnegie Medal for his work, Garrett Morgan was ultimately passed up for the honor. The Carnegie Board decided to award the renowned Hero Award to a white man, a minor participant in the rescue efforts instead of Garrett, based on press accounts that minimized Garrett's contribution. Garrett objected, but the Carnegie Institution claimed that because he was wearing safety gear, he had not put himself in as great of danger as the other individuals. Wow. Garrett entered the newspaper industry in 1920 and founded the Cleveland Call. He acquired a home and a car that Henry Ford created in 1903 as he grew to be a successful and well-respected businessman throughout the time. In Cleveland, Garrett bought the first car for a black person and Garrett was motivated to enhance traffic signals by his experience while driving across the city. Garrett tried his hand at creating a traffic signal after seeing a car crash with a horse-drawn carriage. Garrett was among the first to submit an application for and granted a U.S. patent for a low-cost method of producing a traffic light. Even though other inventors had experimented with, commercialized, and even patented other traffic signals. On November 20th, 1923, the patent was awarded. Gerd Morgan also filed for patents on his creation in Canada and Great Britain. In his traffic signal patent, Morgan wrote the following. This invention pertains to traffic signals, more specifically to those that can be manually operated to control traffic flow and are designed to be placed close to an intersection of two or more streets. Additionally, my idea envisions the production of a signal that may be easily and affordably produced. The Morgan traffic light had three positions, stop, go, and an all directional stop. It was a T-shaped pole unit. This third position stopped vehicles in all directions to make it safer for people to cross the street. Up until all manual traffic signals were replaced by the automatic red, yellow, and green light signals currently in use around the world, Gerd's hand-cranked semaphore traffic management system was in use throughout North America. For $40,000, Gerd sold General Electric the rights to his traffic signal. Garrett lost the majority of his wealth in the stock market crash, along with many others, but that didn't stop him from being creative. Despite having glaucoma, he was still developing a new innovation 
at the time of his passing, a self-extinguishing cigarette. On August 27, 1963, Gerard Morgan passed away at the age of 86. His lengthy and fruitful life was marked by recognition of his artistic talents both then and now. The safety and well-being of individuals all across the world, including minors, soldiers, first responders, regular car owners, and pedestrians, have been significantly improved by Morgan's ideas. His weekly newspaper, now known as the Cleveland Call and Post, after it changed its name from the Cleveland Call, is another lasting legacy. His accomplishments as the offspring of a former slave, despite all difficulties and in the face of racism during the Jim Crow era, are motivational. Now that's aggressive intelligence. That's it for aggressive intelligence. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. See you in the next one.